Okay, we have quite a lot of people already. Um, so I think, Anna, what do you think we should maybe give it a start? And there's a couple of minutes of introduction so people can continue joining during that. Um, yeah, please start because there's still some people joining in the room, so. Perfect. So yeah, first of all, thank you everyone for joining, especially to our speakers for agreeing for this session. We're really excited. Um, today we have our second webinar of these three webinar series. And the focus of today's session is on new methods and study designs within climate change and health epidemiology. Um, we have two great presenters uh, lined up for today um, and a great chair that will be uh, mediating and introducing also these presentations, Professor Vangelia Samoli. Um, I'll leave to her the introduction of the presenters as well as of the topics that we're going to be discussing. Um, but I'm just here to give you a little bit of uh, uh, housekeeping rules for today's session. So as I said, for today we have two presentations. It's going to be around 20 minutes each presentation. And we're going to allocate 10 minutes for a Q&A session right after of each of the presentations. So um, we have it all fresh and we can ask all the questions we need to each of the speakers. Um, as you can see, the event is being recorded and it's going to be available online on our website. So please, we would um, want to ask you to keep your mics off during, during the, the whole session, as well as your cameras. Um, for the Q&A session, what we're going to do is use the chat, um, the chat tab. So please enter your questions during the presentation and then our chair will be monitoring that chat and posing the questions to the speakers. Um, the final thing that I wanted to tell you is that you can, if you want to know more news about what we do at the IC, um, at the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology, please do uh, follow us on Twitter. We post all of our events on Twitter um, and also check our website, um, which you can see here at the top of the screen, um, where you can find all the events that are coming up, as well as any publications that we have recently published, uh, as well as the information for the annual conference. Um, so you can find all the information in there. We have uh, also a specific website for the IC Europe chapter, which you can easily find if you type that on Google. Um, and we also um, update in that website any events that are happening that are specific for Europe, as is the case of this uh, specific event. And with that, um, Yes, that's me for, for today. I'm going to pass it on to our chair. Thank you very much for everyone for joining and hope you enjoy the, the session we have ahead. So all for you, Evangelia. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you. It's every for short, it's easier. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to share these very interesting topics with very two distinct colleagues that have uh, worked a lot in climate change epidemiology. And let me first start the session and uh, without further ado, introduce uh, Professor Antonio Casparini, which is a professor of biostatistics at the London School of Hygiene and Public Health. And he will uh, present on the case time series design for environmental epidemiology. Antonio. Um, hi, uh, Evi. Thanks for uh, the introduction and thanks uh, uh, to the organizers, especially Aina and Anna, and of course the ICE for inviting me to, to give this these, uh, these, uh, these uh, talk in this uh, webinar. So what I'm doing now, I'm starting uh, showing uh, my screen. I hope you can see it. And uh, um, I will start with a presentation. I will be, oh, sorry, quite sorry about that. Try to find it again. Okay, um, I'll try to be quicker because we have only, um, uh, 20 minutes, but all the material is available. You should have received these slides, otherwise uh, uh, send me uh, an email in here or send an email to the to the organizers. And the talk refers to this paper published in epidemiology. You can find it in here. And the brief tutorial I'm giving today after a brief introduction is available in GitHub, my uh, uh, GitHub page. Uh, in particular in here, and we will refer to these uh, specific uh, applications in environmental epidemiology. And of course, you, I hope you know how to do it. You can download uh, everything and rerun everything on your own. So without further ado, I will start with the um, 
quick presentation about these new methods that I've been working on in the, the last few years. Uh, the motivation for it is quite simple, that we are flooded with data nowadays, and we can, of course, uh, put together these data from many different sources, for example, electronic records, real-time data technologies, or remote sensing and everything, and uh, create this uh, collection of large population-based data sets with measurements for individual risk factors, in particular, environmental exposures and uh, personal characteristics. The problem in doing so is that, of course, these data comes from different sources and there are problems, of course, of potential confounding, and in particular, it's difficult to model because you have individual risk profiles through longitudinal repeated me measures of uh, time-varying uh, predictors and health outcomes. So uh, the idea is, in order to introduce uh, my talk, is to give a quick uh, uh, introduction as a methodological case study. Let's imagine that you have a series of subjects which are followed for different follow-up periods, each of them. And uh, this subject can be either exposed or non-exposed. Let's assume it's a binary expose exposures, and they can have an uh, uh, event during this time. Of course, this is a very general uh, situation and it applies to many different settings, in particular, for example, for environmental epi, we can have the uh, uh, exposure to air pollution and having events of asthma exacerbations in this case. But of course, this can vary in many different cases. Now, in order to uh, study this data and to analyze this data, we have, of course, already some, some, some methods. One of them is, is quite uh, uh, famous is a case crossover design is a self-matched methods based on a case control logic in which uh, each event is matched to control times in specific risk sets. And the reason is quite powerful is that uh, just because the contrast in the data is uh, only and, and uh, specifically within subjects, you automatically control for any differences across subjects and therefore you remove a lot of potential confounders if compared to, uh, let's say, between subject study designs. Of course, uh, there is a, a lot of research being done on, on the case crossover with the uh, definition of different control sampling schemes. Uh, another method, of course, for analyzing this kind of data is the, is the time series method. And this is based, in, in fact, on the idea of aggregating all this data, and therefore you have, let's say, averages, exposures, and counts, in this case, of events during the follow-up period, and you model this series as a kind of unique, let's say, a reset uh, in which uh, you uh, uh, contrast different exposure at different times and the uh, uh, event and likelihood of, of an outcome. Uh, of course, these methods is, is definitely more um, limited if compared to case, case crossover for the fact that uh, uh, it is based only on aggregated data, but it provides a very flexible framework and uh, it is complemented with advanced analytical techniques that makes it uh, very, uh, very interesting and very, and very powerful. So, the idea I had is that to try to combine these two worlds of time series and, and individual level self-matched methods, uh, trying to keep the individual level setting of, for example, the uh, contrast of the uh, case crossover methods, but keeping the temporal structure and modeling flexibility of the time series. And therefore, I call these methods the case time series design. The main idea is to subset the uh, follow-up period of the individual in individual series, subject specific series, that are treated as time series data stacked all together in a single uh, data set. Now, why it is so powerful? Because it can exploit the regression framework of, of the time series in which uh, you have a certain um, outcome, y, which is uh, in modeled in terms of different uh, uh, terms and these data can be, of course, these, these terms can be um, uh, function f to model the exposure of interest x, which can be very flexible and, if, if, uh, for example, include nonlinear terms and also lagged terms. You can have one or more functions of time to smooth out the time trends, and in uh, addition, you can have control for time variant confoundings with additional variables. Of course, the setting is a pure time series setting with a specific difference. 
and this is the uh, index i that I'm using here, meaning all the um, uh, series are subject specific. So you have multiple series that are stacked together. And similarly to the self match study, these uh, baseline differences modeled through this intercept here are not directly um, uh, estimated, but filtered out. And therefore, it is very powerful from an from a, uh, estimation and computational perspective, in particular because it can exploit a conditional likelihood uh, framework that it lends itself very neatly for very big data analysis. It's interesting to note some uh, similarities, for example, with the fixed effects model in panel uh, data analysis. And in fact, uh, the idea of this case time series is to extend this uh, kind of panel data to time series framework and building a flexible analytical framework in which you can model differently, for example, for the case crossover, any kind of outcome that is not only counts, but also binary indicators or continued outcomes and any kind of exposures, for example, binary or continuous. Now, I'll give you a brief uh, example using a, um, a, a, a specific case studies that I'm included that are included in the in the in the publication. And this comes from an interesting study, uh, a smartphone study. This is a, a study that exploits data collected through a smartphone app uh, run for some uh, colleagues uh, in Tasmania. This is called iRater, and it's the name also of this. Uh, of this app that they develop to collect basically uh, daily information on allergic symptoms and potentially related aspects through a daily questionnaires from participants that could out freely download the, uh, the app and, and reply in a way and participate to the study. The powerful thing of this study is that through geolocation from, from the uh, mobile uh, technology, you can also link uh, the movements of the subject across the study area, which is, by the way, Tasmania in Australia during 2015 to 2018, and therefore link to each subject at each time specific exposures to a range of environmental exposures that I will uh, introduce in a moment. So you built this kind of framework in which you have such a rich data with individual profiles of different um, exposures. Now. Uh, I'm showing in here a script that is included in as, a, as an example in the, in the paper, simulate, re-simulated some data that uh, I could have made available, uh, make available, uh, uh, and therefore I'm just re-simulating it, and uh, an example of analysis of the case time series. So we start first, of course, loading some packages which are needed, and uh, by the way, I'll be very quick on this uh, presentation with uh, because we don't have much time, but of course you are free to ask questions later. And of course you are free to access these very same uh, script later on to have, a, to, have a, to have a look. So in here, I'm setting some parameters for the simulation for simulating data. So these are the number of subjects, 1600 subjects. And one, I'm starting a start and end date and simulating a date sequence, and then year, month, day of the week, and uh, day of the year and day of the week, that is time variables. Now I'm sampling some follow-up starting time and ending time, which uh, provides a kind of uh, number of person days similar to the original study. And then I'm simulating some uh, uh, functions to model, uh, let's say the distribution, temporal distribution of different uh, factors, which are pollen, PM, and uh, mean temperature. And I'm collecting all together in a single uh, data set. Now, in here, I'm giving you an example of the data. Let me extend it, which are simulated distributions of, uh, uh, of the temporal, in a way, uh, series for pollen, pollution, and temperature, which resembles, of course, are not identical to the original variable. Now, in addition to this, now I'm simulating some uh, baseline risks 
which are simulated as a shared, I mean, a common baseline risk, which varies along the year, and subject-specific deviations from this risk based on personal characteristics. So all the subjects will have a different baseline risk independently by the uh, exposures. Finally, I'm creating some risk functions that based on these exposures, they simulate some risks. This is expressed as a node ratio of having a specific symptom in a specific day. And therefore, I'm simulating a nonlinear effect for both pollen and temperature and a linear effect for PM with potentially a certain lag structure up to five days of, of lag. Then after this, I'm simulating basically the uh, odd ratio for some people. And in here, you can see some examples of uh, the risk, additional risk due to specific environmental exposures for each subject. Now, I'm putting all this together and re-simulating the data for all the participants. This takes um, a bit and put it together in a data uh, example, uh, on a data, data set, which, is, which stores the ID for the subject, date, year, months, and day of the week, if the subject had or not a symptom and the corresponding estimates of uh, I mean, exposure to pollen, PM, and TME. Now, we are ready to do the actual analysis. So we'll start first having a look at the data for a single subject. And this subject is uh, followed up only for a brief period right be before 2018 up to almost the end of the year. It, is, it experiences uh, uh, allergic symptoms only on a few days. And these are the corresponding personal, in the individual level, exposures to pollen, PM2.5, and temperature. So we are ready to run the analysis for the so-called case time series uh, analysis. So the first thing, I define a number of degrees of freedom or a spline of time, that is the usual time series method to smooth out uh, average, let's say, uh, baseline risks across all the periods and use the function ns to define the baseline parameterization. In addition to this, I'm defining a stratum, which is based on the ID, this is a subject, year and months. Basically, I'm creating yearly strata for the subject, which in addition to the control for common baseline risks for this line of time, which is the usual time series, they also subset, in a way, the, the follow-up period for the subject in different months. So in a way, it's something very similar, not identical, but similar to the usual time stratification of the case crossover in which you limit the comparison in specific months instead than the full follow-up period for the subject. The good thing now is that when you have this data set up, you can run an analysis in a very similar way of the type classical time series analysis. So for example, you can use the cross basis parameterization to model complex nonlinear and um, lagged exposure responses. And for example, for pollen, we allow a lag up to three days, actually for all the three of the exposures. We use a spline with two knots at 40 and 100 to model uh, uh, nonlinear exposure responses. And we are using a spline with a single knot at day one to model the lag period. Remember, every time you need to use this group um, argument just because this is not a continuous series, but are separate series for each ID, meaning for each subject stuck together. The same can be done with uh, uh, PM. The only thing, difference is that we model a linear exposure response and we use a so called unconstrained DLNM, meaning different um, terms for lag terms to to model the risk, and the same can be done for uh, the uh, uh, cross basis for temperature. Now you can run a model with this GNM function in which you add all the uh, terms together, that is the three cross basis, the spline of time, and the day of the week, and you need to use this eliminate stratum just to tell the model that uh, the uh, analysis conditional on the uh, stratum within each subject. 
A nice addition in here is that you use a binomial and not a Poisson family because this is not a count, is actually an indicator, yes or no, of potential uh, exposures. And therefore, you can run your model. It takes a bit, but not very much. And then after that, you can uh, very simply, it should be done in a second, estimate some predictions and plot the prediction. So for example, this is, it's not very visible. I can probably zoom it a bit. This is the uh, effect for pollen in which you have a nonlinear exposure response with the risk in a way leveling up at very high pollen level. And this is the full exposure lag response uh, um, surface. Differently, it different is the shape of the, um, of the effect for uh, PM. Uh, of course, uh, you have a linear exposure response as simulated, sorry, as simulated from, as, as, as imposed from the model. And consistently with the, with the simulated data, the effect is limited to lag zero. And finally, you have the effect of temperature showing an effect only for high, uh, let's say, heat exposures and again, the full exposure lag response uh, simulation. So all of this is just the simple analysis that you can do once you have stacked the data together. So uh, coming back in a way to the, to the presentation, uh, the, this is, a, mm, I think, a powerful start design because it, it, basically you can run it using uh, existing uh, functions, for example, in R, and it all impl implies that you create some data management for creating these uh, uh, specific uh, time series. I'll finish by advertising for those of you who are interested in these and other methods, uh, a course that we'll run this summer, also together with uh, Anna, Vicente uh, Cabrera, and, and Francesco Sera in, uh, in uh, Florence. Uh, uh, this year is called Modern Time Series Method for Public Health and Epidemiology. We will present this case time series together with many other methods for, I mean, climate change, environmental epidemiology, and also other public health more uh, in general. And you can find some information here if you're interested in attending. Now, I think I can probably stop here and uh, come back to you for any kind of question you can have. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you for the very interesting presentation and the example it was very enlightening. There is a question by Barak Al Ahmad. Uh, if you can elaborate on the difference between the case time series as presented and the traditional conventional mixed effects lo longitudinal analysis where we use um, a stratum per ID. Yes, uh, well, there are two main differences. The first one is about the data structure that with, through this study, you can exploit the time series structure of the data. And so, for example, you can implement all these methods just like smoothing functions for uh, spline functions and more importantly, probably distributed lag -like models that are based on a specific uh, order and, and sequence of the data differently from many other methods, for example, based on mixed effects. The most important uh, reason, however, is that mixed effects models in longitudinal analysis implies random effects that are uh, that is, uh, are assigned in a way to model baseline differences across subject. First of all, it's much more computationally heavy. And for example, already with the data that I have that are based already in hundreds of thousands of data, you can start having already with this kind of model computational issues. More importantly, these models still have borrowed uh, they say contrast both between subject and within subject. So with those methods, you are more exposed to potential differences across subject that you are not actually modeling. So if there are baseline differences in exposures, these probably introduce a bias if they're not modeled properly as between subject terms in the, in the model. So there are both computational, but more importantly, um, uh, let's say, uh, issues of control for confounding. And this method, similar to the case crossover, is immune, let's say, to any confoundings arising from between subject uh, difference. 
I hope I answered your question. Yes, the answer is yes. Thank you very much. Very good. <laughs> Just to add on to this, I understood from the presentation that the stratum you define is per subject, per year, per month. Well, yes, the, 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 the design is very flexible. So in this case, you probably need it because you can assume that there are both uh, common trends, but also subject specific differences in as I simulated in the baseline differences. So you want to, to uh, apply this re relatively aggressive, let's say, stratification of the data. Uh, however, this uh, depends on the specific application in fact design. Sometimes you have in applications, for example, in pharmacopedemiology, which want to compare, to contrast all the follow-up period of the subject because probably the exposure is rarer, for example. So you need to extend the period and maybe you can make other assumptions about the potential variation in baseline risks within and between subjects. So the depth certification is optional. And of course, the, the length of the strata period can be, can be varying and can be, can be adapted to the specific assumptions in study design. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other question or we can move off to the next presentation and then have a recap? I guess, Rachel, you are on. Thank you very much, Antonio. May I present now the next speaker, which is Assistant Professor Rachel Netherly. She's an Assistant Professor of Biostatistics coming from the Harvard School of Public Health. And she will be presenting their work on integrated causal predictive machine learning models for tropical cyclone epidemiology. Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Evie, and thanks to all the organizers um, for uh, putting together this really awesome seminar series. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, so you're seeing my R code now, hopefully. And let me find my slides. Okay. Um, so like Antonio, um, I'm going to be going through some code examples during my talk too. Um, and you can find the, the corresponding scripts at the GitHub link given here. And hopefully you received uh, the slides via email. So you can click that. Um, just a, a housekeeping note that the code does rely on the R stand R package. Um, and that package can be kind of a pain to install. So if you don't already have it installed, I would recommend um, kind of avoiding doing so now in real time um, because it might cause you problems, uh, but would encourage you to check it out later. It's a really powerful package. Um, so my talk is going to be more focused um, on a particular type of climate hazard, um, which is tropical cyclones. Uh, but I think you're going to see a lot of similarities in the types of methods that uh, Antonio discussed and what I'm discussing uh, here. So uh, tropical cyclone or TC um, is just a sort of catch all term that I'm going to be using to refer to hurricanes, typhoons and cyclones, um, which are just different names for the same types of major tropical storms, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and so tropical cyclone formation is influenced by climate uh, because very specific climate conditions are, are needed for their formation. And so their patterns uh, are expected to be impacted by climate change, uh, although there's still some debate about exactly how. Um, so from the epi side, uh, TCs are known to be uh, some of the most dangerous natural disasters for human health. Um, and when we talk about the health impacts of tropical cyclones, we typically categorize them into direct health impacts and indirect health impacts. So the direct health impacts of tropical cyclones um, are the, the sort of uh, classic things you would imagine, injuries and accident related mortalities that are caused by the tropical cyclone. So things like being injured by a falling tree during a storm or being drowned in floodwaters. Um, and direct impacts, as you can see, are easily attributable to the storm. Um, and so generally in the US, these direct health impacts are captured well by uh, post-storm surveillance that's done by government agencies. However, um, uh, tropical cyclones can also indirectly elevate risk for a range of different adverse health events because they often cause power outages and require evacuations, which can uh, interfere with the use of medical devices and medications. Um, they also usually necessitate a good deal of cleanup, which requires physical exertion and increases uh, exposure to heat and pollution. 
Um, so for instance, someone might have a heart attack while they're cleaning up the damage on their property. Um, and they may have to be hospitalized because uh, their medical devices don't work during power outages or they may need um, psychiatric care due to stress. Um, but these types of events aren't easily attributable directly to the tropical cyclone. And so these types of uh, what we call indirect health impacts are generally not captured by uh, government surveillance in the US. So previous epidemiologic work on tropical cyclones um, uh, in the academic sphere has focused on quantifying the total health impacts, including both direct and indirect health impacts, um, usually of single storms, so single tropical cyclones, or more recently, a few studies um, have uh, looked at quantifying the average health impacts across many storms. Um, as you can imagine, individual storms uh, tend to be really heterogeneous in their impacts. So single storm epidemiology uh, doesn't really generalize well. Um, on the converse, uh, the average across storms is really too coarse of a measure um, to be useful for strategic disaster pre preparation. And so the goals of the project that I've been working on, uh, along with my collaborators mentioned on the first slide, um, are to produce high precision tools um, that allow us to understand both the heterogeneity and the common patterns um, in tropical cyclone epidemiology um, in a way that can hopefully inform disaster preparedness and, and future mitigation efforts. So thus far, um, we've kind of been interested first in quantifying the total health effects of each tropical cyclone that's impacted the US uh, over the past 20 or so years uh, at high space-time resolution. And then after we've done that, we want to try to identify patterns of health effects that are common across storms um, and health effects that are kind of unique to particular storms. Uh, and then finally, we'd like to try to use this information to build models um, that can help us in the future, uh, in advance of future storms to uh, identify communities that are at the highest health risk uh, for disaster um, preparedness purposes. So to do this, uh, methodologically, we've been developing what we're calling causal predictive machine learning models. Um, and as the name suggests, these are kind of big models that contain both a causal inference and a predictive component. Um, so your first question might be, why do we need both of these? Um, and from the previous slide, you might remember that our first aim was to estimate health impacts of past tropical cyclones at high resolution. Um, and that is a causal inference task. So when doing that, we need to make sure we adjust for any possible confounding of the TC health effects and that we capture both the direct and indirect TC health effects. But then the second two aims listed on the previous page, we're really looking to kind of identify drivers of heterogeneity in TC health impacts. Um, so more formally, we, we might uh, wanna be able to relate a tropical, a tropical cyclone's health impact to its meteorological features or the, the features of the affected communities. And this is really more of a descriptive or predictive modeling task. Um, and, um, you know, if we're going to kind of do both causal and predictive modeling, um, we, and we're going to actually use the results of our causal inference modeling in our predictive modeling, we'd really like to formally link these two components so that our final results um, have uncertainty measures uh, that reflect the uncertainty from both pieces. Um, so that's really our reasoning behind integrating causal and predictive modeling here. So just to give you a quick sense of the data that are motivating our work, the tropical cyclone exposure data that we're using uh, are publicly available in the hurricane exposure data R package. Um, and this package contains detailed uh, track and feature information for all Atlantic Basin tropical cyclones um, for about the past 30 years. Um, and these uh, are compiled uh, and modeled from US National Hurricane Center data. And for each tropical, for each tropical cyclone, the uh, the package is providing county level exposure metrics for uh, things like wind speed, rainfall, flooding, and tornadoes um, that are associated with the storm. And so you can see here in the map um, for Hurricane Ike uh, in 2008, the track that it followed and the wind that it produced uh, in each county that it impacted. 
And so um, we're going to pair this tropical cyclone exposure data with a large set of health data uh, that we have access, access to from the, the U.S. Medicare program. So for those who aren't familiar, Medicare is the U.S. National Health Insurance Program for Americans uh, age 65 plus only. So in the Medicare data set, we have dates and causes of hospitalization and dates of death. Uh, for all Medicare enrollees uh, during the period that's covered. Um, we also know their county of residence. Um, and so in this study, um, we use that data to create two week county level counts of four different health outcomes, uh, mortality, cardiovascular hospitalizations, um, and both COPD and all respiratory hospitalizations. Um, and in our analyses, we're going to sort of look at each of these health outcomes separately, uh, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, so before I introduce the, the causal inference model, I think it's helpful just to kind of be able to visualize the data structure that we're going to rely on. Um, so uh, for simplicity for now, let's focus on a single tropical cyclone and a single health outcome. So let's say we're focused on deaths. Uh, so first, we're going to structure the health data surrounding the time of the particular tropical cyclone into what we're calling a panel data matrix, uh, which is sort of like a multivariate time series with counties in the rows and times in the columns. Um, so for each county in the data, we're basically creating a time series of their um, counts or rates of death. Um, covering a time period that begins kind of well before any of the counties were exposed to this particular tropical cyclone um, and extending for some relevant period of time um, after the cyclone when we would expect that there might be health impacts. And uh, from the hurricane exposure data package, um, we're creating a binary indicator of exposure to each tropical site to this particular tropical cyclone for each county uh, in the data. So we're designating each county as exposed or unexposed to this tropical cyclone. Um, and the time points that are in blue here um, in this panel data matrix um, indicate, you know, death counts that were observed um, during a tropical cyclone exposure in in exposed counties. And so these uh, uh, panel data matrices for each tropical cyclone are, are going to be uh, key to the causal inference piece of, of our modeling. So I think uh, just as a quick aside, many of us know that kind of the standard way of estimating health impacts of tropical cyclones or a lot of different extreme weather events um, is to just use what's known as an excess deaths analysis. So in the simplest case, um, in an excess death analysis, um, you might just estimate an expected number of deaths uh, that would occur in the absence of the storm using data from the same period of time in previous years in the same place um, and compare that to the number of deaths actually observed during and after the, the storm exposure. So uh, using this average of deaths from prior years is a kind of simple way of answering the counterfactual question of how many deaths would have occurred during the storm period, but in the absence of the storm. And the most notorious example of this type of analysis is the kind of high profile ones that were done uh, for Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, like this one from uh, a New York Times analysis. So uh, returning quickly to the causal inference piece of our model, um, we're going to be trying to answer this same counterfactual question um, as in the previous slide with just a slightly more uh, sophisticated approach. And I'll justify that in, the mom in a moment. And we're also going to try to, to do estimation of excess deaths um, at high resolution. So uh, let's start with our panel data matrix. Again, for a single tropical cyclone, a single outcome, let's say deaths. Um, we're going to first start by removing or setting to missing the observed number of deaths for exposed counties during and after the exposure. So going back to our panel data matrix, um, the blue time points here um, are going to be set to missing. So then we're left with this matrix that only includes observed death counts in the absence of tropical cyclones. Um, and we're going to treat these values that were removed as missing values that we need to impute. And so at a high level, um, to estimate the, the number of deaths that would have occurred in the absence of the storm, so to fill in these values, our model is going to compare trends in deaths in exposed and unexposed counties 
uh, prior to the storm and then use that information along with trends in the unexposed counties during the storm exposure time. So this information to project the number of deaths that would have occurred in tropical cyclone exposed counties absent exposure. So to fill in these missing values. Um, and formally, I'm not going to go into detail, but the model that's that's used to do this is a latent variable model that's uh, kind of similar to factor analysis. Um, and in the machine learning world, it's called matrix completion. Um, and we've extended the classic matrix completion approach uh, here to accommodate count or rate outcomes. Um, and we've done model fitting using a, a modified Bayesian approach. Um, and so a major benefit of this method is that we don't need to worry too much about confounding because under pretty mild assumptions, um, the, the factor structure um, that's included in this model, uh, you can think about it as being able to, to capture time varying unobserved confounders. Um, and so the model uh, has been shown to be able to adjust for, for time varying unmeasured confounders under pretty mild assumptions. And so um, that's what sort of makes us want to use this model as opposed to something simpler, like a difference in differences design that's often used for uh, pre-post analyses that can only account for um, non-time varying unmeasured confounders. So um, then the output of this model is the number of deaths that would have been expected in exposed counties in the absence of exposure. Um, and we subtract that from the observed number of deaths during the tropical cyclone to get estimates of excess deaths for each exposed county. Um, and in practice, we're going to apply this matrix completion approach to each tropical cyclone's data separately. Uh, I don't have time to go into the rationale for that, but uh, definitely see the paper if you're interested. Um, so now I'm going to actually um, switch to a code example quickly. If I can see where my our studio is okay um so i can't share the real health data uh with you uh, that we've used here for privacy reasons um but uh the code i've provided include uh, like uh, antonio's includes um code to to generate synthetic data that has roughly the same structure as our real data and so here i'm showing you the master script for uh this analysis of the synthetic data and this is available uh, at the GitHub link that I showed you um, at the beginning. So um, in this data set, um, or sorry, in this script, uh, first we're uh, just loading the, the relevant R packages, setting seeds, and our simulated data here are gonna contain three sort of synthetic tropical cyclones. Um, so I've already run the first couple of scripts here um, that are called within the master script that generate the synthetic data. So that's already stored. Um, um, in a list, uh, which I will show you here, just to give you a sense of how the data look. Um, so there are three tropical cyclones in our data, so three elements of this list. And each element of the list is also a list containing um, a, a bunch of different pieces of data for each individual tropical cyclone. Um, and the most important piece of data for each tropical cyclone is this Y0 OBS matrix. Um, and that's the, the matrix that I just described to you that we're applying the matrix completion method to. So it's the panel data matrix for a given tropical cyclone with the number of deaths observed during the exposure period set to missing. And we're gonna try to fill those in. Um, so to give you a sense of what those um, panel data matrices look like, um, this isn't very well labeled, but um, the, the columns here are different time points and the rows are different counties. And in this uh, little toy example data set, um, these final 15, I believe the final 15 counties um, in the data set are uh, exposed to the tropical cyclone and exposure occurs only during the final time period. So you can see uh, the corresponding entries of this matrix set to missing. Um, so again, these are the matrices that we're going to uh, apply the matrix completion uh, procedure to for each tropical cyclone. So in this third script called from the master script, um, we're kind of, you can just glance at this and kind of see that we're um, looping through the tropical cyclones in that list sequentially and applying, we're doing a little, first uh, doing a little bit of um, data cleaning and then um, applying the matrix completion procedure, which is implemented uh, in our stand. 
to the Y zero OBS matrices. Um, and then um, finally outputting um, the set of posterior samples of the, the excess, uh, sorry, the number of deaths expected in the absence of exposure uh, for each county uh, affected by the tropical cyclone. And so I'm actually not going to run this in real time. It takes about 10 minutes to complete because um, Bayesian methods are fairly computationally slow and, um, and we're running them multiple times here. Um, so uh, I have already run it uh, before this uh, started and, and saved the output so we can proceed here. I'm going to skip over the, what the fourth script does because I haven't had time to introduce um, the summary measures that's computing. And then this fifth script is what will compute um, the county level excess death estimates for each tropical cyclone. Um, and um, it makes various plots that show the, the excess deaths both at the county level and the storm level. So just running this quickly. Um, so you can see um, in this first plot, um, the county level excess deaths are shown by the points and they're grouped by tropical cyclone um, as indicated by the box plots. Um, you don't need to worry too much for now about the, the coloring of the points because I haven't introduced this X1 variable yet. Um, and so that's kind of how we're gonna show the, the county level um, excess event rates that are estimated by the model. Um, and then we can also compute the total excess deaths by tropical cyclone. Um, and here we're just showing those um, estimated excess deaths um, for this synthetic data. So this is not real. Um, and uh, as well as the, the uh, uncertainties. So jumping back um, to our uh, slides here. Um, so in practice, um, we're, uh, we're implementing what we call a modularized Bayesian procedure um, where we apply matrix completion separately to the panel data matrix for each tropical cyclone and get estimates of the excess deaths for each county that it impacted. Um, and then um, we're gonna move to the descriptive or predictive component of the model where we pass those excess death estimates from all the tropical cyclones that we've estimated with the causal models um, into one big predictive model. And so in this model, the county level um, estimated excess deaths are gonna be the outcomes shown here by the thetas. Um, and we're modeling the relationships between those excess deaths uh, as well as uh, and the meteorological features of the storm, as well as socioeconomic uh, or demographic features of the impacted counties. Um, and again, we're utilizing this modularized uh, Bayesian modeling approach. Um, and we're going to, that's going to allow us to pass the full set of posterior samples of the county level excess deaths. Um, so the full set of posterior samples of those rather than just the estimates um, into the predictive model. And that allows us to capture kind of the uncertainties that arise from both the causal modeling piece and the predictive modeling piece. And the predictive model is gonna give us insights into what features are associated with high risk, uh, which is what we really wanna know uh, in order to inform strategic preparedness. Um, and in this slide, the G function here could really be any predictive modeling approach. So something like linear regression or something complex uh, and fancy like black box uh, machine learning. And what we found so far in practice is that linear models uh, with, with or without splines tend to work just as well as about anything else for this predictive modeling in our data. So that's what we've stuck with here for the, the sake of interpretability. So I'm gonna just quickly switch back to the code. Don't have too much time left. Um, but um, just want to give you a sense of, of what you get from the predictive model. So uh, back up at the top in script two, uh, I actually generated some synthetic predictors uh, that I've called X1 and X2 um, and saved um, those in a data frame called PRED, which I'm showing you here. So uh, for each tropical cyclone in each impacted county, we have values of these predictors X1 and X2. Um, and in script five, um, we previously saved the full set of posterior samples of excess deaths in a matrix, um, and we're going to pass those in to, to now fit the predictive model in a modularized Bayesian way. 
And so I've written an R function uh, to fit the linear predictive model in a way that, that does integrate this full set of posterior samples of, of the excess deaths. Um, and so we're applying that in script six. Um, and our model is, a, a, again, a linear predictive model that allows for a natural cubic spline on the variable x1. Um, and we're saving the posterior samples of the coefficients from that linear model. And then in script seven, um, we're simply uh, compiling the estimates from the predictive model and plotting the spline fit for the predictor x1. And so you can see here uh, from the spline plot, um, that on average, um, as this synthetic predictor X1 increases, the excess deaths due to the tropical cyclone also increase. So having higher values of this X1 appears to, uh, to make, uh, it appears to be a feature of the county or the tropical cyclone that, that leads to higher uh, risk of death. The association does appear to also be a little bit nonlinear here. Rachel, I'm sorry, I'll have to ask to wrap up. Sure, yeah. Um, so I won't go through the real data results um, since I am lacking time. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but, uh, but what we see um, from our predictive or descriptive uh, component of our model is that uh, the biggest, our biggest takeaway is that the maximum sustained wind speed produced by a tropical cyclone in a given county is by far kind of the strongest predictor of its health impacts, um, which may seem obvious, but uh, hadn't previously been well characterized. Um, and uh, the, the paper is in press now at Biostatistics, but I don't think it's posted online yet. So uh, if you want more detail uh, on the motivations for the method and the, um, the methodological um, background, you can uh, check out the preprint paper on archives. Um, and I will wrap up here to leave time for questions. Thank you, Rachel. I don't see... Any questions on the chat? It was too much info. <laughs> uh, there is one from Malcolm Mystery. Uh, if you had applied the model to ex examine the Eastern Pacific Basin hurricanes, it's the first question. No, we would like to, but um, we don't have uh, such nice data sets that um, that give us good information about exposure um, over there. So that's definitely a next step, but we haven't been able to get our hands on on good modeled um, hurricane data for for the any of the Pacific Basin hurricanes yet. And another question from Ina Roca Barceló is. Um, Concerning the last part of the presentation was to characterize mainly the most at risk communities. Uh, my question is, how are you planning to do that if your health data set only includes above 60, 65 year olds? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, this is um, a kind of a limitation of the data that we have that we only have, um, you know, older people. Uh, in the data set, so we're not capturing. When I say we're capturing total health impacts, I mean direct and indirect health impacts, but not um, health impacts on the entire population uh, of the county. So, um, so yeah, so we're not going to capture those. Um, we still think that, um, like with most um, extreme climate events um, or most uh, environmental exposures, that the the older folks uh, in the county will probably be at the highest risk uh, of the types of events that we're looking at, which are severe uh, events, hospitalization and death. Um, but yeah, we will certainly miss um, some, some cases among younger people. And another question from Chris Fairless. Uh, ap apologies for the <laughs> way I pronounce some names. So mm -hmm. you said that flood information is one of your inputs in the predictive model, I guess. How significant was that? Because you presented the wind speed in your last slide. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that's a really good question. So um, we actually have really coarse um, data on, on floods. Um, basically, we just have like a county level indicator of whether flooding occurred or not. And that's all that's really available right now that we know of. If somebody knows of something else, I'd love to know about it. Um, but basically that's way too coarse um, to, to really uh, get any 
useful information about floods, which are highly localized. Um, so we haven't actually integrated flooding information, uh, mostly just wind speed and rainfall information into our predictive models. Um, and surprisingly, it seems that rainfall amount is very weakly, if at all, associated with kind of the immediate acute impacts of tropical storms. Um, we think it might be more impactful in the longer term because um, flood, you know, rainfall and flooding can cause mold development and things like that, but we haven't gotten to the long-term study yet. And I think the last question is again from Aina Roca Barceló. Are you planning to explore inequalities across communities, for example, by socioeconomic level structure, infrastructures? characteristics of neighborhoods and so on? Yeah, I know that's a great question. Um, yeah, we've definitely thought about trying to extend this to model, um, you know, kind of data that are stratified by socioeconomic status um, or demographics. Um, so that's that's a, a next step that we're aspiring to, but still figuring out how to do it. Great question. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, we have to wrap up because we are running out of time. So instead of taking other questions, I suggest to the participants maybe to email the presenters of any further information that is needed after going through the, all the material they have provided. And I would like to ask the two presenters if they want to wrap up or... Uh, uh, I would like to both okay. thank you very much. <laughs> Antonio, please. No, no, no. I, I, I mean, I, I, I would like maybe to, 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 you know, to congratulate Rachel and, and all the colleagues for her presentation because and, and her modeling. I think it was very interesting, and I'll try to find the time to have a look at the code as well. It's it's very interesting to see all these uh, you know new enhanced statistical methods applying under specific areas of uh, environmental epidemiology, both in the causal association aspect and also in the predictive that it's more policy relevant. So I agree, but uh, both presentations were very informative on how to apply uh, more enhanced and sophisticated methods to uh, investigate our specific objectives per time. So may I give back the floor to the organizers of the webinar and thank them for their really interesting setup. Yeah, I just wanna say thanks for including me, really honored to be here. Um, and um, yeah, looking forward to continuing the dialogue with everybody on, on methods for climate change epidemiology. Thanks. Same for me. Thank you so much for joining. It was a great, a great session. And I think we all agree with that. Um, sadly, we don't have enough time for questions, but um, I guess our speakers would be happy to follow up on email if that's the case. Um, also, we wanted to let you know that the recording is gonna be posted in our website. Um, we'll send an email with all the information and I will attach again, the two presentations uh, on that email to make sure everyone has access to that um, and can run the examples as well. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye for the next webinar, which hopefully will happen sometime after Christmas. Uh, and it should focus more on the science communication and translation aspect uh, of climate change science. So looking forward to seeing you there. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.